metabolism, but about molecular biology and targeting things with molecular, trying to probe single molecular targets. And, you know, these molecular targets are like an alphabet so to those who are unfamiliar with them. And I'm, myself, I'm trying to learn more about this. So mTOR, you know, which means my tongue is uh, overly red. No, it doesn't mean that. It means, but it could just as well. It's actually the mammalian target of rapamycin. That doesn't tell you very much. But in fact, rap well, rapamycin is a drug that inhibits mTOR. All right. It doesn't tell you anything. All right, but anyway, my point is that these are all targets that have been sought by molecular biologists because they're believed to have a role in inhibiting the growth of cancer cells. Another target is PI3KAKT, and a lot of different uh, substances have been developed. Fatty acid synthase, I mentioned, is a target. AMPK, that's a adenosine monophosphate kinase. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor has been targeted. Bevacizumab is on the market, actually. It's being used in treatment of cancer, others. Now, this is a very simplified diagram of some of these molecular pathways. So if you, if you remember back to biochemistry when you thought the metabolic pathway, pathway chart, that huge thing was complicated, you know, it's, it's really nothing compared to the complexity of these molecular pathways. Absolutely nothing. So mTOR is one of the things that's been targeted, right? And uh, notice that mTOR sort of occupies a central position here. And, uh, but you notice that in the periphery of the mTOR pathways actually is PI3K, AKT, AMPK, HIF1-alpha, all these other things are in its periphery. And uh, let's see, AMPK, if you look at the AMPK pathway, see it's in the center. But meanwhile, PI3K, AKT, mTOR, fatty acid synthase are in the periphery of that chart. And let's see, if you look at the AKT pathway, similarly, all these other things are in the periphery of these pathways. And my point is really that um, these pathways are very complex. If you looked at them in totality, you realize that targeting a single protein has even conceptual problems. These are very tightly interconnected and interregulated pathways. Many single proteins have been targeted. I mentioned a few that the knockout or knockdown of a single gene or a protein is exhilarating. And I can tell you because we've just started to do it in our lab. You know, we feel we have so much power. We can actually target a single gene. Isn't this thrilling? You know, we're gonna. It's, it's marvelous. And the problem, however, as I say, is that. These signal pathways are, are so complex that counter-regulatory changes, I think, almost need to be expected. Because most of these things, you know, you, you raise up one of them, and then the other one ends up going in the other direction, and that's what ends up happening. And in fact, the efficacy of these single protein molecular targets has been so-so. But for fun, let's just take a look at the downstream effects of insulin. And um, insulin's up here. Now, and I'm, I'm, you're going to have to take my word for it, but um, PI3K, AKT, mTOR, AMPK, RAS, and other ones, tumor growth, tumor, they're all downstream of insulin. And what I mean by that is that they're all affected, and they're all affected in exactly the direction that you would be doing if you were targeting them individually. So, how about targeting insulin itself? Well, if you knock out insulin, you're putting a patient at risk not only of their cancer, but for another potentially fatal disease, which we know is diabetes mellitus type 1. But an insulin knocked down, just reducing insulin is actually quite easily accomplished by a technique we're all familiar with, carbohydrate reduction. Many of these single downstream targets have already been explored. So is it possible that carbohydrate restriction could produce a coordinated knockdown of mo many molecular targets, otherwise requiring the administration of many drugs? That's sort of one thought that might occur. Okay. Meanwhile, how effective is carbohydrate restriction in knocking down insulin? Very effective. This is uh, from a recent article by Hernandez et al. In fact, John Eccles was one of the authors, as I recall. Uh, Richard helped colorize this for me. Um, and uh, despite their, uh, you know, their, their way of spinning their conclusions into somehow that low carb was uh, bad for you, um, their data were, you know, very supportive of interesting effects. That the baseline diet shows these spikes after meals. A high carb diet shows spikes after meals. A low carb diet practically flattens out completely. And as I say, the insulin downstream effects are all the very same things I've been telling you about. mTOR, PI3K, AKT, AMPK, fatty acid synthase, and so forth. And we're all in the correct directions. Now, 
Okay, now I'd like to back up to metabolism because um, this is uh, this molecular stuff has been more recent and certainly suggests a plausible role for cough restriction in cancer management. But um, it's uh, it's only been recently that we've been getting into that. So we were thinking about this more along metabolic lines, and I want to review something called the Randall cycle, which was first proposed by Randall and Newsom and others back in 1963. And here's a little brief cartoon of uh, glucose getting it past the cell membrane into glycolysis, producing 2 ATP per mole, and then entering the mitochondria py pyruvate, going to acetyl CoA citrate, and so forth, producing 36 ATPs per mole. Right? So, okay. Now, what Randall proposed was that either on a I don't know that he was thinking particularly of a very low-carb diet, maybe starvation, but either way, that fatty acids and ketones provide alternative ways of making acetyl-CoA. And that by doing that, acetyl-CoA is known actually to inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase, the final step here, and citrate is known to, oops, inhibit something, ah, phosphofructokinase up here, early in glycolysis, so that he proposed that fat and ketone bodies ought to inhibit glycolysis. Now, this is um, the Reynolds cycle. There's one. Sorry, I just want to compete with them. Um, one other thing that you have to know, keep this in mind for further reference. The Krebs cycle here makes NADH. It doesn't actually make ATP directly. The ATP comes from hydrogen ion manufactured in the course of the Krebs cycle, which has to get across an inner mitochondrial membrane. In other words, the Krebs cycle is what's called coupled to the production of ATP. Keep that in mind. All right, now it turns out Randall was right. He was right for the animal, for the model that he constructed. And, but Bob Wolf wrote a splendid series of articles, which he summarized, and he took data actually that was done by Thibaut and DeFranzo from 1982 Metabolism, which was actually basically a reproduction of Randall's original work in an animal model, and this was actually done in humans. So this is from Bob Wolf's paper, uh, adapted further from DeFranzo. And what you see is that as they're increasing fatty acids, insulin is, oh, insulin is constant, and glucose uptake is going down. Well, gee, that's, that's just what he said, right? increasing fat. But one thing you have to realize, what he did was, his animal model and what was done in this human model was, he applied to all the subjects what's called a hyperglycemic, hyperinsulinemic clamp. This is not a physical clamp, but it's a physiologic clamp. It maintains insulin at constant levels and maintains glucose at constant levels. So what he's doing, by, what he's achieving by doing that, is ensuring a constant maximum supply of glucose to the cell under conditions of a constant maximum supply of glucose to the cell, it's constant, it's unchanging, then what happens is, if you then infuse increasing levels of fatty acids, well, then it turns out you do, do reduce glucose uptake. The problem is that free-ranging people don't eat, except that unless nowadays they're on a low-carb diet, generally don't eat fat in isolation. They generally eat their chocolate cake, which has carbs in it too. So, oops, I guess I... Did that. All right. Do decreased dietary glucose is uptake is actually unlikely under usual dietary conditions, where we take increased carbohydrate with fat. Okay, that's the usual circumstance. And carbohydrate stimulates insulin secretion. Insulin, arguably the most powerful hormone in the body, drives glucose into cells by a glucose sens uh, insulin sensitive transporters, and then glucose availability just vastly dominates any potential inhibitions of phosphofructokinase or PDH by acetyl-CoA and citrate under usual dietary circumstances. So that, in fact, under free living conditions, insulin dominates, Randall will be wrong, and carbohydrate intake will actually inhibit lipolysis.